George Kilpatrick, inspiration for the nation, celebrating people we feel good about. Vanessa Chaplin is the project counsel for the New York Civil Liberties Union. And so, Vanessa, just explain that that's a little different than, for example, what Yusef al Qadir was doing in, in a very similar, sort of similar, not similar, but uh, as a Central New York chapter leader. Um, yeah, so long story short, the New York Civil Liberties Union itself is a chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union, which is a national organization. Um, so in the New York Civil Liberties Union, there's two offices in New York City, and then they have eight regional offices. Um, and the regional offices, they have, um, they just recently changed their title to regional officers, I believe. And so what they primarily focus on are regional issues, right? And so they're the ones that are on the ground in the regions, um, similar to the Central New York office, they got a Buffalo um, office, Rochester office, and they bring those very specific regional issues to the New York City office and say, these are issues that you guys should be concerned about and you guys should care about. Uh, and the ID1 project was one of those things. And so Yusuf Abdul Qadir, who was the previous chapter director, brought the ID1 issue to the New York Civil Liberties Union as a regional issue that, that we should care about. And that was the beginning of my position. And so when I first took on this position, I was project counsel to the Interstate ID1 project, right? Um, in my first two years of working for the New York Civil Liberties Union, I focused primarily on ID1. I have since now taken a new position where it's the same work when I was just statewide. So I don't just, I, I spent a lot of time in Syracuse and, and I'm always gonna be biased towards Syracuse because I live here, but my job is actually um, to look at environmental racism and environmental injustices um, on a statewide level. And uh, congratulations on your new position. Uh, and your work uh, advocating for communities uh, across the state, many of whom are black and brown because that's where environmental injustice has been uh, targeted, if mm -hmm. you will, right? I mean, that's that's a fact. We don't have to exactly. deny that. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that you, one of your platforms is to tear down the structural racism of I-81. Can you talk a little bit more about what that means for our community. So, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of times we use a language like structural racism or institutional racism, and it's really hard to identify where and what that is. Um, in Syracuse, we have the misfortune of being able to clearly identify what structural racism looks like here because we have this major roadway um, with a very devastating history. And so we know that that structure, right, that actual physical structure was built on the back of a Black community. Um, and the dismantling of a Black community, um, a working class Black community, right, um, who didn't receive their fair share in the original build. So that's an example of, of structural racism because, well, what happens to the property owners who don't move, right? So properties that are close to a viaduct go low, right? Decrease in value because who wants to live under a viaduct, right? Properties next to a major highway are overexposed to air pollution, overexposed to noise pollution. And Frankly, folks who could afford to move out of that area, they do, or they did back then. And so you're really kind of concentrating poverty in, a, in, a, in an area where it's the most unhealthy area in the city of Syracuse to live. And so we're talking about just on an environmental level, they're overexposed to all of these toxins because they're so close to a viaduct, but also it serves as a physical structural barrier to the EDS, which is the educational institutions and the medical institutions, right? People who live in that footprint may not be able to tell you the law school directly across the, on the other side of the viaduct because they can't physically see it. And so there's, there's a disconnect there between the opportunities that Syracuse residents have in that community versus what I, what's just on the east side of the viaduct where we have a flourishing um, community. Yeah, and so part of the action on 81 is what happens next. So the community grid is the preferred option uh, that we've been hearing uh, about, and we're close to it now. I, I, just for the record, this conversation has been going on for for many, many years, and we were supposed to have a decision three, four years ago. Now, <laughs> having because I was a, I was doing TV back then, and they told me seven years, and that was 2010, and it was supposed to be decided upon in 2017. So here we are. And so Community Grid is an option, and I know that 
you in particular have been outspoken as your group has been about a couple of things related to this particular project. Uh, can you talk about those things? First of all, I love your background. Thank you. <laughs> that, is, that is so cool. I, I, I don't know how you did it, but it looks really realistic. I love that. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so um, so I do remember my, so my first legal job out of law school, which was in 2012, was working with Sam Roberts, mm -hmm. um, the assembly member. And I remember in 2012, we would have meetings in his office, in his office about the viaduct. Mm -hmm. um, and he was very outspoken about what should happen to the viaduct. And with community groups then advocating around what should be happening to the viaduct. And we you know people like uh, Van Robinson who's been talking about the viaduct since 2006, right? Like this thing right. needs to come down. So we've had we've been having these conversations for a very long time. Um, but at the end of the day, right, it's unsafe. It's unregulated. It doesn't meet the federal regulations or guidelines of what a safe highway is today. It has four times more accidents than any high the a highway of its size and capacity um, in the nation, um, and 11 times more deadlier accidents, right? Um, as a result of the way the highway is built, it doesn't have shoulders, it doesn't have safety precautions, and we get snow. So that's not a good combination right. on a very narrow highway um, that has a lot of interchanges. Um, so yeah, I think <clears throat> I think to your to your question, I think we all agree it's a great first step to remove the viaduct. That's a great first step in the right direction. We want to get rid of that structural barrier. Um, but there's so many unanswered questions that that are of just as valuable concern, like for example, the future land use. Right. Um, what we do with this land when it becomes available, and, and for your listeners, there's gonna be 18 acres of land that becomes available um, once the viaduct comes down, is just as important as the viaduct coming down because that's going to either build the community or continue mm -hmm. to segregate the community. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things that I think our organization is really looking at to make sure there's a fair and equitable distribution of land once the viaduct comes down. Um, another major concern is the on and off ramp. Mm -hmm. um, so the DOT is currently, the, the New York State Department of Transportation is currently uh, planning to put an on and off ramp, which is, which is a roundabout, um, less than 200 feet away from an elementary school that services pre preschool kids and, you know, up to fifth grade. Right. Um, and so that that's obviously just physically not safe, but also like we talked about a little bit earlier, like the environmental impact of still keeping that roundabout so close to the school. Um, first of all, it goes against the Environmental Protection Agency's uh, recommendations. They've been warning communities since 2011 to stop doing the practice of putting roadways near schools because developing lungs have permanent impacts, right? They are they are permanently scarred as a result of being overexposed to air pollution. The CDC, the Center for Disease Control, has also warned against doing that practice. So in a time where we're trying to build for the future, we need to be making sure we are being um, as, as cautious as possible when it comes to the build. Then I think the final thing, and I think we've been hearing a lot of uproar about this, is like, who's going to get the jobs? on the project. The project's going to be seven years long, um, good paying jobs, construction and otherwise, right? Professional jobs, construction jobs, who's going to work those jobs? Where's the money going? Where's the money gonna flow? Yeah, you know, and, and, and those are questions. So from the perspective of how you're looking at it, making sure that things are fair and that the questions that the community has are answered, right now there hasn't been any from my understanding, there's been no alternative presented to that off ramp at Dr. King's school. I mean, as and and as as the community has expressed that concern over and over and over. So where do we stand with that? As you, as you understand it, that's a point of contention. I mean, that's a, that's a real point of contention. What I will say is, in 2000, December of 2019. Maybe December 2020, sorry, December 20, I, I lost the pandemic year. Um, December 2020, um, the NYCLU released a report on Building Better Futures, uh, written by me and one of my colleagues. And we highlighted that as one of the major concerns that we kept coming across in our workshops. And this was mm -hmm. an issue for parents and teachers and faculty and staff of the school. Mm -hmm. um, what I will say, though, is we met with the New York State Department of Transportation uh, about three weeks ago at this point. And we did see a lot of things that were in our report in the new document. Well, we were told they were in the new document. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, 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 we'll verify it once the document is released. But, um, but that is still a point of contention. And that's something that I think they're doubling down on 
of keeping that on and off ramp there. And the justification is uh, they want a welcoming sign to Syracuse. Like that's a, that's a great point to have like a welcome to Syracuse because you go to most cities, you enter the city, you know you're there. So it's, you know, welcome to Rochester, you know, congratulations with, with the banner. Um, so they think that's a great place for a banner of welcome to Syracuse because the first, per first thing a person will see when they drive into Syracuse is this beautiful new community, flourishing community grid what they're calling the business loop, right? So they'll see that and it's a great opportunity for development and it, it will it will bring development to our city and be, you know, bring some economic development and, and funds and resources to the city, which the city needs. And that's great, but that's not a that's not a good enough justification of why you're going to be impacting the lives of children. Like we mm -hmm. need to have a stronger um, justification on why you have to put the fire on and off ramp there. There's many other places you can put it. And we, rec we recommend it without identifying uh, a location because we're not engineers. Um, it needs to be 600 feet away. And that's what the EPA recommends. That's what the CDC recommends. So you just need to do the right thing and put it 600 feet away, period. Um, but that's not what they're doing. Um, they can put it on Kennedy. They can put, there's so many other places they can put this welcome to Syracuse. Um, and and there, there's also, you know, under currents of racism. Like that's, we gotta call it out. I mean, what would be the problem with putting the welcome to sign in Syracuse on um, Kennedy? Well, well, I can think of a few, right? Well, Kennedy may not be the most resourced street, right? It's a black neighborhood. Mm -hmm. and so maybe they don't want to have people say welcome to Syracuse and they enter into an under-resourced, underfunded black neighborhood. Well, there's an easy solution, fund and resource that neighborhood. <laughs> so when Sounds they like do that, sir, Right. right. So when they get off on Kennedy, this is welcome to Syracuse. It is a beautiful neighborhood. Make the neighborhood tree line, resource it, make it pretty. So, I mean, we all want to have a, a, an aesthetically beautiful surroundings. Everyone wants to live in a beautiful neighborhood, not just economic developers and not just people who are transient or transplants. We all want to. That's something that everyone strives for. So provide resources for communities that you don't want people to see. Let me pause here because I got of my colleague in my head who always says, when someone comes on, tell, ask them to tell you how, how they got here. So you use the <laughs> word transplant. So now I got to ask you, tell me about your own background in this community. Okay, so I am not a transplant. I am a native of Syracuse. Um, born and raised here. I got uh, three sisters. Um, they, they all have three kids apiece. So I got a lot of nieces and nephews. Um, my father, my father's family, we're all here. Um, I was born and raised on the south side of Syracuse. Um, I went to Danforth Elementary School, Clary Middle School, got kicked out. Um, I used to get a lot of trouble, had a loud mouth, talked a lot. Um, that's not that's all I do is talk. And um, I went to Henniger High School, graduated. I took the long route, went to OCC, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, and then I transferred to um, Long Island, went to undergrad, and I stayed away for 10 years uh, pursuing my education, but also my professional development. Um, after I graduated from undergrad, I stayed in New York City for about four years after graduation before deciding to finally take the plunge and go to law school. Um, and, just, and just to be honest with you, George, I didn't come back to Syracuse like I'm going to come back and live here forever. Um, I came back as an adult because um, I hadn't seen my family in years. Um, I went to law school in Miami. So I went from New York City to Miami, two very big cities, very, very vibrant cities, very yeah, you great like, you, oh, oh, you was, you was. <laughs> <laughs> You know, a great city to live in. If you're single, you're young, you know, this is the place to be. So I didn't, I didn't have the intention of moving back to Syracuse. I was going to come to Syracuse, say hi to my mom, say hi to my family, because they were giving me a hard time study for the bar exam because I, there was nothing to do here. So I was like, I can't, I won't be distracted if I go to Syracuse to study for the bar exam, which is a six week long study period. Um, so I can go there um, and study in peace and not be distracted. And I'm telling you, coming back as an adult, fully educated, fully informed about the issues, I was shocked. I, I, went, I'm, I was literally shocked. I had no idea the conditions in which I grew up in. Like, mm. I didn't know I grew up in a segregated community. I just didn't know it. Mm. Uh, when I came back as a full adult, I didn't know where City Hall was. Wow. You, like, you didn't know? So I, no. Um, I, I came back as a adult looking to study for the, the bar exam. Uh, I got an I got a internship opportunity to work on a campaign. Um, and they were like, yeah, meet me at City Hall. 
And I was like, I have no, I've never ever been to City Hall. Mm. I just had no reason to go. So I'm like, I'm in my hometown Googling where is City Hall? Um, I really believe when I left at such a young age that Syracuse was a predominantly black city. I just had no idea that that was just my personal experience, mm -hmm. that the community is so segregated that black and whites don't interact. I just didn't know that. I mean, I knew that my teachers were, didn't look like me, I knew they were white. I just didn't know um, that the city was the makeup of it was. And I was, I didn't know that. We but you went like, to Henniger, right? I mean, didn't they? I mean, Henniger is a multi-ethnic uh, uh, space. See, Henniger is a, a multi-space, but you know, there's, there is, there is, well-researched and well-documented segregation, even in schools that are that are integrated. Okay. Oh, and so, so what, even within the space. Okay. Exactly. So what what you'll find is when you get on certain tracks as a student, and that track is determinative of where you're going to go as a high school student. And so what you'll notice, and and this is something that our organization is addressing now. What you'll notice is in schools that are that are integrated, even though New York State has some of the most segregated school districts, right. those schools that are integrated, the predominantly white kids are on the AP regents track, mm -hmm. right? So they're in the AP classes. And if you get to the AP classes and, they'll, and um, there's a low, so even, even though I wasn't an integrated school, I was, I was definitely on the track of like this girl ain't graduating with a regents degree. Okay. Um, so you're going to stay over here with, in these classes. And so, I mean, that was just my real reality. And so when I came back, I was, I had looked back on, on how I grew up and I was like, man, I didn't know this was happening. Interesting. So we're talking to Lanessa Chaplin. She is the project counsel for the New York Civil Liberties Union. Started the conversation about uh, the work that they're doing, uh, particularly around 81 and making sure that 81 is accountable to the community. Basically, the project uh, and the tearing down of the viaduct is account accountable to the community, among other things that the New York Civil Liberties Union is doing. Um, and so one of the things that I asked Lanessa was, so tell me about you, because uh, she made a comment about transplant versus uh, I, people who grew up here. But then you told me about the, the, your journey, and I really appreciate you telling me about that journey, because it makes me think about community, right? So that we had that intact Black community, 15th War back in the day. And is it realistic that, that we're ever going to recreate something like that, number one? But that's that's a separate question, but or even maybe I'm just rhetorical there. But at the same time, how do you take the other Lanessas on around the way who go to Danforth, who go to Clary, who may who who may not know where City Hall is, or who may not know <laughs> where Syracuse University is? That's right. Right, right, and right, right up the street, you know. So what what can you what can we talk about that makes sure that people have that kind of exposure. So first I wanna, I wanna just touch on your first question. Can we ever get back a 15th ward? I'm gonna say absolutely. Mm -hmm. We absolutely can. I mean, villages and towns are incorporated every day. Um, land use is determined of how you can use your land. So I say absolutely. Uh, I think that's something that's really missing in Syracuse um, is a middle-class black neighborhood. Yeah. And that's something, honestly, I didn't know existed until I moved out of Syracuse. And yeah. I think that is a lot of people's reality. Not to say there aren't middle class Black people here. Of course they are. Right? And in pockets um, of various communities. Yeah. That's right. In yeah. pockets of various communities or living outside the city of Syracuse. Right. So you don't interact with those, those um, families, right? right and right. they tend to be few and far between in their neighborhoods. Um, so I'm not going to say they aren't, there obviously are, but there is a real richness when you have a community of people who are a middle class, working class, upper class community of people of color. It's a powerful moment because it sends you such a very concrete message that that can be you. Because if you never see it, you don't know it. So, so you mean like in PG County or in the Atlanta ring or in all of these other places, Harlem, New York City. And I know these places are all undergoing transformations, if you will, but that's what we're talking about. That's what we're, so I would say, absolutely, we can get another, uh, another 15. Okay, more. so what, what people will say, well, what's the east side then, right? Don't we have some of that there? 
We do. Okay. We, do. we got some. We got some. We got some. We got some good pockets east side. I, I you know I remember growing up, Mountain View was the area. Right. Right. That That's what I was thinking area. of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's so it's, it's it's sad. We're like, oh, you saw if you from Mountain View. That's where you live. Like, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. That's that. That's what I, how it was. <laughs> That's how it was. It was like if you lived in Mountain View, you had you know you had both parents, you had all the you know you had all the stuff that came with living in a middle class lifestyle, but. I think absolutely we can get that. I think absolutely we can get that back. And I and I and, and what I mean get it back, I mean a place where we can have we can have businesses. You know, I, there's no reason why we can't. It's it's just a simple matter of right. zoning and resources. Mm -hmm. If you want it, you know, create it. It can happen. Um, you you think about these cities like the town of Clay or Liverpool. I mean, at some point they they became incorporated. They got mm -hmm. land. They got land use. They right, got resources. Right. And it's like the fastest growing part of the county right now. That's right. Right. And the things that we don't think about is the fastest growing, the, uh, uh, the fastest growing in the county, our tax dollars still have to pay for their development. Our tax dollars have to pay for them to have water, running water, right? Because now you got to stretch out the water pipes. Now you got to build the infrastructure. You got to build all the things that come with living in suburban America. Uh, we're, we're in Syracuse, we pay taxes. So our taxes benefit everyone. Right. And so as they're expanding and we're going extinct, that's a problem. Uh, so that's the first part of the, that's the first part. Um, and, and the second part of like, how do you, I don't know, I don't know, George, how do you reach those, how do you reach those kids who um, don't necessarily. Ex exposure, right? Like how, you know, you thought there was, you didn't, you had a limited view of the world and how is it, how can we take other little Anessas and have, help them to, to get off the block and see more than the block? Because part of uh, part of what we hope to do for young people is just give them exposure so that they know that they have as many choices as they want, right? Not to say that they that they can't have the choices around the neighborhood, but I'm just saying that they have exposure to as many choices and opportunities. I'm sure it's happening in some places, but I, I mean you're 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 a young lady, <laughs> so so my point is. It's not too far long. That's not too long ago for you, right? Yeah. So, and I'm not trying to get you to tell your age, but I'm just saying it's not too long ago. So how is it that, how, I, and maybe it's just, maybe we ought to think more about making sure that kids within our own communities have exposures. Now, then I think about when I grew up in the Bronx, right? You know, I got, you know, we, we hear so much about Columbia University and all of these places, but I don't think I, ever really went on the campus of Columbia as a kid, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. not, and not for any reason, I just don't think I did, but I knew it was there. Right. Um, or I just knew it was on 116th Street in the city and that was it. But I did go on Fordham University's campus uh, or, but, but again, the way it's situated, cause I grew up in the Bronx. Um, and I think New York is different anyway, because you're also, even if you're not on these campuses, you're also exposed. I went to high school, on a college campus. My high school was the High School of Music and Art, which was right on the campus of City College of New York. And so instead of going to City College and paying no tuition, I, <laughs> I came to Syracuse University to play thousands of dollars of tuition, <laughs> okay? You know, let's let, you know, but that's when actually tuition was free. Every city resident could go to any one of the City University of New York system. So. I'm saying all that to say um, exposure, I think is really important. Lanessa, before you go, um, what are some of the other, so so 81, how can we keep our eye on that ball, number one? And then what are some of the other issues that you would like us as a community to keep our eyes open about so that we can stay on top of it? From your perspective, because obviously the Civil Liberties Union is making sure that all voices are heard uh, across all spectrums of identity. You know, first, I just, the exposure question, I think is really important. I think that's a mission of mine. I think that's so important to me. Um, I try to do as much as I can with the youth. I was a part of like the STEP program and other other programs that were in the city, Syracuse City School District because I didn't see anybody like me growing up. So it's important that people see someone like like them, but, but also talk like them. I got the yeah. same Syracuse accent that they do. I mean, we don't like to admit it, but we got an accent. We talk funny. Um, so like just just kind of being like look I I I I am you like I am I you can see your reflection in me I am yeah. you for me I, you're I'm a lawyer right I this right is, I made I, it yeah. I made it 
and there's nothing and there's nothing that can stop you um if i if i made it from the same circumstances or similar circumstances from the same region um so that's really important to me um it's also part of why we created the black bar association i mean just to have a black bar association we're still trying to get it together but when we get it together hopefully it'll be as powerful as it needs to be mm -hmm. um, for the community especially for the youth to understand that there's a collective of, mm -hmm. of, of, of powerful black and brown attorneys in syracuse mm -hmm. um things to look out for i mean i'm, I'm so bogged down with the ied1 project mm -hmm. continue to look out for that um we we are creating a, an alert form or we're creating um or like robo texts where we can text people updates um so if you want to be a part of that um happy to give you the information for that so you can sign up to be a part start getting alerts give it up uh so yeah you can just email me l chaplin at nyclu.org that's l c h a p l i n at nyclu.org um and I'll put you on to our listserv so you can start getting the um, email alerts and also the text messages. Uh, one thing that we did, I thought you you, you might have noticed is when Pete Buttigieg's USDOT came, we were able to use that alert system to get people out there with their signs of racial justice to pick it. We got about 40 people out there in, two, in less than two hours because of this new uh, um, alert form we're using. So hopefully they'll be successful. We can really push. push what did you meeting. accomplish with that visit? with his visit, what was the message you sent there? Uh, he's up. Um. <laughs> so we were just talking, so just let just to include the audience. And I was like, boy, your son is uh, napping well. And we were all like, you were all like happy about that, but he said he sleeps good. But so I know our time is really short. So go ahead and answer what you can, what you can. We will let you do what you got to do. I think, I think, we were able to get some messaging across um, eventually. So I, I wouldn't, it wasn't an easy path that, um, that meeting um, had its height schedule, but you know, Deca, uh, Tandeka Dancel and myself, we were able to do some private conversations with um, Senator Gillibrand, Schumer and um, uh, USDOT Pete to talk about some of the issues we talked about here. And then we followed up with them with the two pager outlining those issues and some of the recommendations that we thought were important. And that he needed to know about, and, that and he uh, needed to know about, especially because those are the elected officials who are saying this is, this is the racial justice project. Well, let's make it really be a racial justice project. Six degrees of separation. I was on the plane with Pete Buttigieg when he came to Syracuse. <laughs> oh, really? I, I was. I, you know, I was sitting on the plane. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then, and the Secret Service was pulling up. I was like, okay, I see you, Pete. Go ahead, do your thing. I didn't get a chance to really talk to him. But well, that means you were on the plane with Carl Hasty too. Because Yes, Carl Hasty. Well. Yeah, we we were all in, <laughs> in, in Kennedy. We all came up. I didn't see Pete in Kennedy, but I saw Carl Hasty. Uh, he was on the phone like the whole time. Uh, so I did see him too. Yeah, you're right. I saw him both, both of them on the plane. So yeah, I was balling that day. I was, you know... <laughs> I was actually just returning. So I, that's why I was there uh, early in the morning like that. So, all right. So, Lanessa, uh, are, are we getting the hook? Are we, are, we got, are we getting the hook right now? What's the hook? To, to, we got it in our call? No, I know. No, I mean, we, no. we're good. We're good. Yeah, we're good. We're good. I, all right. So, I, I'll just leave you. So, you said 81, and the, people can get the text alerts. And um, I'm really glad you're doing the work, man. I think there's so much to talk about so much to, to, to get to. And I thank you for the detour about who you are and your background, because I think it's important. Um, my friend, uh, Vicki Bracken says, ask your guests where they from so people can know where they at. It's like, it's so Vicki, I'm, giving, you, I'm gi giving her a shout out because she was <laughs> like, it's, in, it, it's definitely important for our audience to know where, how people got to where they are. And I know you even wrote uh, years ago, a very long Facebook post about, your journey uh, mm -hmm. and 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 all some of the things that you highlighted earlier about I got kicked out, I did this and this and that. Now look at the very thing that got me in trouble is the very thing that helps me be the best advocate I can be for my community. And so welcome home. We you know, <laughs> we, we 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 and then and then you you know you settle hopefully you you will will have many more years of your expertise in our community. Anything else you want us to know or leave us with? The only thing I'll leave you with is because you you um, rehash the memories on the Facebook. Is I think the reason why I tend to do that every so often is because sometimes it can look like this person is 
has it all or this mm -hmm. person is all put together and you can kind of can forget their journey. And so mm -hmm. I'm like, no, there was a journey to get where I am today. And I also think it's just as important for young people to hear that message, but also for older folks to hear that message. Just, you know, from my experience of growing up and just having such, ex I mean, I just never stopped talking. I always thought I was great, <laughs> but it also turned a lot of people off, right? Like I didn't mm. have mentors. I didn't have people who really wanted to yeah. work with me because of my attitude. And so sometimes yeah. adults need to hear, like you need to be able to look past a person's, especially a child's attitude and work with them. Because mm. even though you don't think they're listening, they're listening. Um, and so I think that message really goes both ways. Yeah, I thank you for that. And my next question was, if you did you have any mentors? And you just said you didn't have any. And so now as an adult, do you have any? No, you know, when I growing up, my mentors really became the folks that told me I couldn't do it. Mm. So then I had to use that as fuel and motivation to be like, oh wait, yes, I can I can do this. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, now I have I have a ton of mentors. Um, you know, Lance McKinney is, is my one of my biggest and my first. Uh, mentors and you know my biggest cheerleader he's the person I go to and call um, for whatever reason any legal question I have or any advocacy question I have he's he's the point person for me um, judge jo uh, Vanessa Bogan is another mentor of mine um, I really look up to her and value her opinion and then I have a ton of mentors who are even younger than me like I admire and value Deca and all the work that she does in the community and how she's so resilient um, this is Decca Dancel at the Community yeah. Foundation. Yes, we want to call I, it out. Yeah, I have, I have, I have a ton of mentors, and I have so much to learn from people of different generations. I'm just like, yeah. okay, all right. Now, I'm, now I'm not afraid to ask questions and be open to that. And thank you for being open about your story because I think so many of us, especially in our community, we're not willing. Uh, either it's somebody else is telling it, or you're you're deciding to tell it yourself, and I think that's really important. All right. So the website is nyclu.org, but lchaplain at nyclu.org, C-H-A-P-L-I-N, lchaplain at nyclu.org. If you want to get the text alerts the next time somebody big time rolls up in the queues and the community's <laughs> voice needs to be heard, That's right. you want to be on that list, <laughs> let's go. Let's do it. The, this revolution is going to be digital. <laughs> Thank you. Great, great tagline. <laughs> thank you. Listen, Lanessa, thank you for being on the program and uh, we wish you all the best inspiration for the nation.